Hi, everyone. My name is Ann Vandermeij. I'm a tech editor at Bloomberg. Um, we have here a really stellar panel to talk about the ins and outs of the new world of tech regulation. And I'm just going to let them briefly introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Heather Burke. I'm a partner in the Silicon Valley office of White and Case. Uh, my practice is antitrust litigation, and I am the office executive partner of our office there. My name is Eric DiUlio. I'm an associate at Goodwin Proctor, and I represent technology and emerging companies in privacy and cybersecurity. My name is Kathy Vidal. I'm the managing partner of Winston & Strawn's Silicon Valley office, and I work with tech companies on IP and other tech issues, and I also am an investor. I'm Ruby Zeffo. I'm Uber's first chief privacy officer, which means that I'm the person in charge of all the privacy programs at Uber. So let's dive right in. It seems like big tech is facing a backlash. Public opinion seems to be turning. Does this mean that new regulation is necessarily going to follow? Ruby, I'd love to start with you. So first of all, um, I, I have an issue with big tech. Um, I worked in the tech industry pretty much my whole legal career. And my last job before Uber was putting the silicon in the Silicon Valley. And so when people talk about the Silicon Valley's doing this or that, you really have to be more careful about what you're talking about. And if you're talking about big platform companies, then say so. And I think what happens is people are very concerned about what's happening with their data. And they're right to be concerned. But that doesn't mean we should all be tarnished with the same brush. All right. So in terms of DC policy, it seems like we're, tech is getting a lot more attention. Heather. Do you think that this means that government scrutiny is sure to follow? For sure. Um, we've seen both the DOJ and the FTC, at least in the antitrust space, take more of an interest in tech companies, certainly most recently. Uh, in February, the FTC started a technology task force that was going to be focused solely on tech companies. Um, and the DOJ just last week issued a press release that they're conducting investigations into uh, big online platforms, mostly social media, search, and retail, which I think most people recognize means Google, Facebook, and uh, Amazon. So uh, investigations always lead into cases, uh, and they lead into enforcement. And then beyond that, that then leads into private litigation and class actions. So I think for sure we will see more um, cases and enforcement coming out of these investigations that they're conducting. Right. Kathy, what do you think? Is the uh, macro picture affecting your practice at all? So in terms of patents, I don't think the macro picture is generally affecting patents. Uh, there is a lot of activity going on right now. There's a, a general thought that uh, before the American Invents Act in 2011, that patents were too, it was too easy to get a patent and a lot of patents were weak. And then after the American Invents Act, the tide has changed completely in the other direction. And now there's a thought that it's very difficult to get patents on anything, especially many of the technologies discussed this morning. That's separate from the backlash against high tech. Um, as to the backlash, we are seeing some activity from the DOJ where they've got concerns about standard setting organizations and would like to change the rules of engagement with regard to standard setting organizations. So that's where we may see some action. And Eric, what do you think? I mean, we're in California. Privacy law is sort of a hot topic. Um, what's the lay of the land? Yeah, so, so California passed the CCPA, which is going to be the first sort of generally applicable privacy law to come to the United States. You know, for a long time, we've had healthcare privacy regulation. We've had financial privacy regulation. Uh, and the CCPA will go into effect in January of 2020, and it'll, it'll grant consumers you know, a plethora of new rights and, and impose several new obligations on businesses. Um, there's a number of other states considering legislation, Washington, New York, Texas, Illinois. Um, and I think the extent to which the federal government gets involved will kind of depend on whether any of those states are going to go beyond uh, what California has done and, and create, you know, sort of additional obligations on, on companies. I think that is what would really ratchet up the pressure um, for something to happen at the federal level. So I have a question for everyone on the panel. In your respective areas, what is the regulation or the body of government or the case that you're watching the most closely that might have the biggest impact on companies? Heather, it'd be great to start with you. 
Sure. So I think, um, I mean, the Apple uh, Pepper case just came out recently uh, with respect to class actions. That doesn't really affect uh, regulation, but it is something that everyone is sort of watching now in terms of how um, Apple's platform may change as a result of that case um, and how selling to consumers can actually um, uh, be altered as a result of that case. And I think, you know, in terms of regulation, the DOJ and the FTC, they really follow the EU in a lot of respects. Um, a lot of what happens in Europe, Europe is far stricter in their antitrust uh, regulation and enforcement. And so a lot of what happens there, the DOJ and FTC then sort of follow on. So I think we're going to take some cues from EU and see, you know, what happens there. Or does that sound about right? GDPR coming yeah, to the US? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the CCPA was modeled on, on the GDPR, which is, is the European privacy regulation. Um, and I think two things that I'm watching really closely are there's an aspect of, of the New York law which would require companies to serve as data or information fiduciaries. Um, so the idea behind that is, like, a company that collects your personal information is bound to, uh, or is bound not to use that information sort of to your detriment. Um, and so, you know, I think that's going to be subject to some strenuous challenge by businesses because it's going to put potentially board of directors in a, in a seriously conflicted position. Um, and it sort of echoes an idea that, that Gavin Newsom mentioned in his State of the State this past year for California where he talked about um, broaching the idea of a data dividend which would give sort of like, you know, Alaskans have this, this oil dividend where the whole, the whole state kind of shares in the revenue generated from that resource. Um, and so that there's conversations being had in, in Sacramento around like, you know, how could we implement that? And, and that's still in its very early stage, but I think, you know, those are two things that, that even under the GDPR, which is, you know, hands down the most strenuous and, and onerous kind of privacy regulation in the world. I mean, those are two ideas that the GDPR hasn't even put into effect. So the hottest issue in patent law right now is really patent eligibility. What is and is not patentable. And, and that's the, the hottest issue when it comes to venture and investing. There was a survey done recently of 475 VC firms. And about three quarters of them said that patent eligibility impacts their investment decisions because if, if they invest in companies that can't protect their technologies, others can enter the market and their investment isn't secure. Actually, 40% of them said the law as it exists today impacts the value of their investments. And on patent eligibility, there has been a lot of activity in the past year um, and even in the last few months. Even as, as recently as this month, there was a decision from the Federal Circuit, which is really the, the court below the Supreme Court, um, that essentially uh, it, it, the Federal Circuit issued an opinion where a lot of the judges felt a need to voice their concerns about the existing patent law and how it's not protecting investments, including in medical diagnostics. So the, the concern with, with regard to investments is it takes, for example, the medical diagnostic field, it takes about 50 to $100 million to commercialize a medical diagnostic tool. And if you can't protect that investment, then people aren't going to make those, those types of contributions. And that's, you know, medical diagnostics is one area. A lot of the technologies that were discussed earlier, AI, crypto, um, a lot of these companies that have different business models or that are more software and computer-based, those are really suffering right now in terms of investments. And the computer software industry, um, which includes computers as well as software, between 2017 and 2018, patentability in the patent office um, went down by one half. So in 2017, about 20% of those inventions were rejected and patents were not issued. In 2018, 40% of them were rejected. So we're, we're really seeing a time in history where more than any other time, at least before the 1952 Patent Act, it's very, very difficult to patent and to enforce rights when it comes to emerging technologies. So this is an area where companies are pushing for more rules. They are, they are. Um, so in, before 2011, there was about seven years of activity, a lot driven by Silicon Valley companies, where they were concerned about patent trolls. 
as they were called at the time. We've moved off that term. Um, but they were concerned about them, and they thought there were too many patents issuing. There was a, a famous story about a dog stick patent. And so they asked for the laws to be changed in a way that made uh, patenting more difficult and patents stronger. That's now gone full bore in the other direction. And there was testimony recently in Congress about this very issue where there were companies, there were um, you know, different entities testifying before Congress that we need patent eligibility to be broader. We need to be able to patent these emerging technologies or we're not going to be competitive with other nations. I'm trying not to get too worked up about every state um, proposed law that comes around. They count them, they go, Washington and New York being the most recent rise and fall. Um, what I am concerned about is finding some kind of consistent framework, a principled framework where people have transparency into what's happening. I think what people are angry about isn't so much what's actually happening in some instances, but they don't understand what's happening and who can blame them. It's really hard to figure out. And sometimes I think they would agree to the benefit of the bargain if they only knew how it worked and what they get for the data that they're giving. So what I'm hoping for is some kind of framework within we, we can still innovate, because that's really important, particularly to this country, um, but provide some consistency no matter where you are, no matter whose hands the data is in. And that requires you know, that we don't have technical mandates, that things don't get too specific, but they, that they afford a principal basis at which we're we're approaching people's data. And then if you're going from country to country or region to region and there's a different ethical compass for whatever reason, Europe has its own history, which I completely understand. That's very different than US history. There are toggles that you can move. It's still the same framework. But for example, you want to be able to delete your own account, but maybe you don't like the right to be forgotten. Well, that's something you can change, but still have the same framework. Maybe you want more opt-outs versus opt-ins, right? But still the same framework, so that companies have something that they can comply with on a consistent basis, so you, as the customer, don't get a different experience everywhere you go. And you, know, you have something that's relatively easy for consumers to understand. That's what I think about. So speaking of a couple different frameworks, um, we have California working on its own privacy legislation. I would like to ask a question of the audience. You guys are, have been taking a couple polls. Here's a new poll. Which states will follow California's lead on tech privacy regulation? Your options are New York, Illinois, Florida, Texas, or Washington. So I will read those one more time. New York, Illinois, Florida, Texas, or Washington. And to your point, it seems like if these states do follow California's lead and maybe don't adopt the exact same laws, we're going to get sort of a patchwork of state-by-state -state regulations. Maybe there are 50 different laws that companies have to follow. Is that going to be a problem? Well, we already, so just to be clear, the only patchwork we have now is some of the federal laws already mentioned and the state data breach notification laws, which are a patchwork and are very difficult um, to follow. So a patchwork is problematic. Yeah, it's very problematic. Um, so, so beyond geographic boundaries, I mean, first of all, if you're in California and you take a car over to Nevada, you want the same protection. You don't want what happens in Vegas not to stay in Vegas because <laughs> suddenly Nevada has a different data protection law. But it goes beyond just, I mean, people are focusing on geography, but what about whose hands the data is in? Remember that the reason the US is deemed inadequate to accept European data and why we have all these um, different methods to get their data here, which are all under scrutiny right now, is because of the Snowden revelations, because of our government surveillance. So why do we not care? Why is it not on the table that the, that the data isn't just going between companies? It's going to government entities, everything from a municipality all the way to federal government agencies. And no one's talking about that. It's in the GDPR for a good reason, but it's not in CCPA. To me, it's a big gap, and no one's talking about it. So I get concerned that the protections follow the data across geographic boundaries, across corporate boundaries, and into the public sector. Eric, what do you think? Are we likely to get a couple different laws, or is there going to be a framework that companies are able to follow? Yeah, so I mean, I think the CCPA is, is the most onerous that's come to the US so far. Um, and it's, it's probably a small step down. I mean, there's some differences between that and the GDPR. But I think that's, it's roughly kind of a similar approach. Um, I, I think the, the chances of, a, of federal legislation will kind of hinge on the extent to which other states follow the CCPA versus create something different. Um, and, you know, like 
to take the, the Vegas example, Nevada did recently pass a law, but it's significantly less, less onerous than California. And so, you know, yeah, like a Nevada resident or if you travel into Nevada, you know, the, the data protection is different. And you, like query whether that makes sense for companies and whether that makes sense for consumers and, and whether it makes good sense just as a matter of policy. I mean, the law to me should be the low bar. I want the customer to have a good experience. And so if Nevada isn't doing what I'm already doing for California residents, then I should be thinking very hard whether or not I'm going to actually follow the law or just do more. Right. You know, we already put a lot of features in our product that people, they're not legally required. If you don't want to put your address in there, you don't have to. Go to the corner. You know, you, we have address obfuscation. You can have an in-app chat with your driver who doesn't have your um, phone number. Those are not legally required, but we do them because people, people like them. And we take features out if you don't like it. We thought it'd be brilliant to put calendar and contacts if you felt like it, importing them in there, because people like to share where they're going with their loved ones. Well, guess what? People didn't like it, so we took it back out. That's the lens I think companies need to start using. Not whether I can get away with less in Nevada, but what should I be doing to provide a better user experience? Right. So do you feel that Uber has been able to get out ahead of some of these new laws? Well, we, we have to comply with GDPR anyway, right? right? It's very difficult when you have a multinational program to specialize it for every region. That said, we are a very local company, and there are things we have to comply with in particular regions. We also have different issues in different regions that we want to attend to that will help the region um, be more productive. So I can't say it's completely consistent, but the framework and the lens at which we look at it and having a unitary customer experience that's good is very much consistent, and we follow principles across the whole company. So it looks like Washington is ahead. Uh, New York only at 41%. Illinois, Florida, and Texas all at 3%. Does that sound about right? Sure, yeah, I mean, you know, I think the, the Washington law, I think, did not pass their House. I think it passed the Senate. It passed one chamber and didn't pass the other. Um, and I'm not sure exactly this. I think New York might be in a similar boat. It may have passed one and is, is being considered uh, on the other side. Um, but, you know, yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see, see what happens. Yeah. So this brings me to a question of are is following these different laws going to be harder for startups? Um, we have a bunch of venture people here tonight. Um, should smaller companies be more worried than the larger companies about complying with some of these rules? Um, you've worked with startups before. Are they intimidated by the amount of regulation? I mean, I think to some extent they are. For, for really early stage companies, technically the CCPA doesn't apply until you hit a certain revenue threshold or a certain volume of, of data processing. Um, and I think in one sense, sort of coming of age in this era of increased data regulation is a benefit because there are, you know, there are companies with tremendous amounts of legacy data um, that, that they didn't sort of tag and didn't plan for how to respond to some of the, the rights that the CCPA grants. And so they have like thousands of fields of data and, and responding to an access request with a customer that they've had a lengthy relationship with is going to pose a significant problem. Right. Um, in, yeah. I can say in the antitrust space, yeah. usually um, startups take a view that, oh, those, that's for monopolies. Uh, we're not big enough. We're never going to be big enough. We don't have to worry about antitrust. But as the DOJ and FTC begin these investigations and begin more and more of them, um, Startups will be contacted to determine if they're viable players in the market, to determine if they uh, actually can compete with some of the others, um, if startups are interested in potentially being acquired by someone else, uh, the DOJ will get involved. Um, so, you know, my at least advice is to always make sure you have, quite frankly, a lawyer there with you because a lot of um, other investigations come out of earlier investigations that the DOJ did or the FTC did. We found information over here, and now we're going to use it against you over there. So um, it's always best to make sure that you actually do have lawyers if you're contacted by the government. Right. And so we hear a lot about how antitrust is going to empower the little guys uh, in their fight against the big guys. Do you get the sense that startups are excited about that, or are they worried about the possibility of not being able to get acquired because you have these companies worried about getting too big? I think it's probably both. Um, I, the acquisition is definitely um, something that the DOJ has been focused on, this whole idea of a killer acquisition, right, that they are eating up all the smaller companies. Um, 
and then not being able to grow themselves. But a lot of times, either acquisitions or joint ventures are the ways in which that innovation grows. The, the only way that you can get those resources sometimes and the money for the smaller companies to build on their innovation and to actually you know, get it out to the masses. So it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act for sure. What do you think, uh, extra regulations onerous towards startups? Well, when I think about startups and the IP space, I worry that they're not patenting enough. I think it's very difficult for them to carve out money to patent their inventions. And if I were an investor, which I am, I, I would want to make sure that the startups are spending that money and are not only looking at the laws that exist today, but are thinking about the fact that it is going to evolve. That you know, if history holds true, the patentability standard will change. So even if you're investing in an AI company or a cyber company, they should still be getting those applications in just like the big companies, or they're really going to be at a disadvantage. Right. So I, I was just thinking of it more. Um, if you're a startup, you should be thinking about privacy by design. It shouldn't be something that's onerous and attack on, or your products are going to come out wrong. Think about it like safety. You know, we don't ride around in cars anymore that if they're rear-ended, cause a fiery death. And we expect that. We expect things to be safe without us having to think too much about it. So that's the lens you should be looking at when you're building your products. How do I build privacy in from the start instead of trying to bolt it on afterward when it's more costly, less elegant, and you come up with some kludgy design? Looked at that way, that's where the innovation comes from. It doesn't hinder it. You should be thinking that way to start with so that we don't end up with some of these issues we've had more recently where people are very surprised at what's been happening with their data because they had no idea. Right. So that is a good uh, segue into my last question, which is just basically, what should companies be doing to prepare? Um, and Eric, I'd love to start with you. You know, we're talking about gathering data. A lot of this is used in advertising. That is a big source of revenue for a lot of the big companies around here. Is this going to fundamentally change the way the tech industry works? I mean, I do think there, you know, the, the CCPA, it, it's clear that it was sort of targeted or, or drafted in response to, to the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Uh, and so I think there is an idea of, of, of doing this transparency. And, you know, I think, and I think it kind of dovetails on like that, that's something that companies should be doing anyway. Um, so I think it's, it comes down to just like understanding what data you have and, and clearly communicating what you're doing with it and, and who it's being disclosed to, to, to your users. And I think if you, can, if you can get that taken care of and, and also just to take a, a careful look at like, do you really need to be collecting all the data? that you're collecting, I think, is, is like a sort of a good preventative measure that companies can take at this point. Is there anything preventative people can do for antitrust? Uh, compliance programs, for sure. Making yeah. sure your uh, employees understand the antitrust laws and not violating them. Um, understanding what they can actually talk about uh, or talk to with their competitors. Usually this falls in the realm of sales. Uh, sales folks wanting to, to talk to their competitors about um, you know, wh what they're doing in the market. So I think that that's probably uh, the biggest uh, issue for startups to probably think about. And plus, like I said, getting lawyers. Right. Just, <laughs> nobody likes lawyers, but. <laughs> what do you think? Get a good lawyer? Is there anything else people should keep, keep in mind? Yeah, I, I think just patent, patent, patent. It's, it's how you protect your investment, and it's also an added value because a lot of the value of startups is in the intangible assets. I mean, look at the Nest purchase. I mean, a lot of that value is IP. Look at Motorola, the purchase and the divestiture. That was, there was a lot of IP there um, that had value. So I wouldn't give up on our patent system yet because I do think it's going to change. Yeah. Um, I would just say keep, keep your eye on the customer experience because yeah. happy customers don't complain. Right. And that is, unfortunately, about all the time we have. Thank you guys so much for being here. This has been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.